Sally, you're going to read the scripture. <coughs> so if you read Revelation chapter 9. Yeah, so all of it, yeah. So, yeah so. Wow, whole yeah. chapter. Yeah. The fifth trumpet, the bottomless pit. This is Revelation chapter 9. Then the fifth angel sounded. I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. He opened the bottomless pit, and smoke went up out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given to them, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. <clears throat> and they were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die and death flees from them. The appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle and on their heads appeared to be crowns like gold and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like the hair of women and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron and the sound of, of their wings was like the sound of chariots of many horses rushing to battle. They have tails like scorpions and st stings and in their tails is their power to hurt men for five months. They have as king over them the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in the Greek he has the name Apollyon. The first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still coming after these. The sixth trumpet army from the east. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, one saying to the sixth angel, who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released so that they would kill a third of mankind. The number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them, and this is how I saw in the vision the horses and those who sat on them. The riders had breastplates the color of fire and of hyacinth and of brimstone, and the heads of the horses are like the heads of lions and out of their mouths proceed fire and smoke and brimstone. A third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone, which proceeded out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and their tails. For their tails are like serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. Thanks, Sally. That's great. Okay, so let me pray. Father, we ask you to bring the revelation of your word to our minds so that what you intended for us to receive today with regards to this scripture read would be as you have planned it. We pray that we would be able to gain insight so that we will be strengthened and equipped according to your intention. We know that unless your spirit reveals, we cannot receive. We want to make ourselves available to you, to be open to you, to understand. So help us to stay focused, even on the things that we can't as yet see. In 
in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I guess if we were to ask you now, what did that scripture mean to you? If you hadn't read it before, you probably would be able to say very little. You may well have read it a number of times and you might well be able to contribute some consideration in terms of what you think it might mean. One of the books, uh, one of the things that uh, Christians struggle with is the book of Revelations for all sorts of reasons. Um, and different Christians fall into different camps and they kind of come up with different ideas. And I guess really the controversy over the book of Revelation, because it is the last book in the Bible and because of the content in terms of what it's intended to say and do, uh, it you know, creates that sense of, you know, what does this really mean? How does this really work? What is this really saying? Um, and they almost throw off the, uh, the management of how to uh, come to Scripture, a good exegesis, how to approach Scripture. It's almost like they seem to throw it out the window. And so the principles and the, and the ideas of the, f of the five criticisms that we use to establish you know, biblical truth and pathways uh, are just somehow lost in Revelations. And they don't apply the same principles. So people come up with some really weird and wacky things. And you're left thinking, you know, why did you do that? I have to say this is the first time I've ever gone through from chapter one to the end. I've read it many, many times and studied different parts of it. But it's been a real pleasure for me to be able to start from one you know, head towards 22. Because it's kind of given you a framework in terms of an identification and a familiarity of who the individuals are, it's sort of fresh in your mind as you, each time you approach it, which has been really helpful for me. And I hope, you know, in the explanations I've been given, uh, have been helpful for you too, in terms of forming some ideas and thoughts. And you'll remember one of the things that I considered and brought to you in terms of one of the management tools of looking at the book of Revelations is the idea of idioms. Do you remember I talked about idioms? Things that are declared and said, but actually don't mean exactly what's being said or declared. And so there's this formation of, of almost a, an example that will enable us to, if we took it literally, it would, li it would mean something, but it's not meant to be taken literally. It's meant to give you an explanation in terms of what it could be. And John uses many of these in chapter 9. There are many references to these idioms. So it's like it says something, but it's not actually saying what it says. Now, there's a lot of scripture that says what it says, what it says. And, and Revelations is, has lots of that as well. But there are times when John uses the concept of, and this is like something, meaning it could be like that, but it's not necessarily. So one example of that, and I'll give you that later, is, you know, this is like uh, the, the fire from a furnace. Meaning it's like the fire from a furnace, but it doesn't actually mean it is a fire from the furnace. And so we have to kind of evaluate that in the context of what, what John is presenting to us. Otherwise we get ourselves all tripped up and we start imagining things. Um, so I want you to hold that, dear, because John 9, uh, uh, Revelation 9 is talking a lot about uh, and, and uses lots of little idioms to convey things, but aren't actually what they actually say. But likewise, when John says that's what they are, that's what they are. So when he used the term, to the, we, we, we read already, uh, the term they're lo locusts, that's what they were, they were locusts. He didn't say they were like locusts, he said they were locusts. Now, they were locusts with a difference, but they were locusts. And I wanted to get Debbie, I don't know why she didn't, but I wanted to get Debbie to stand up and say in, in, in with the worship time, did you know, do you remember I introduced the concept on, on uh, Tuesday last meeting about did you know, and then someone said did you know, and she was supposed to read five things about locusts. I don't know why she didn't. I'm going to chat to her afterwards. But she was going to tell you that locusts are solitary creatures. They, they're, they're not, they're, they're, they're kind of, they, they like being alone, but they have a split personality. So it's almost like uh, they're kind of good boys and bad boys. And uh, when, when they come on the scene as bad boys, they kind of swarm together in the development of their early years because of lack of food and they create a big problem. But most of the time, they're just individuals. They, they, they don't have a queen. Do you know locusts don't sting? They suck your blood or they suck. Um, so they, they pierce you, but they, they suck. They, they don't sting. But here we get in this chapter... Locusts that sting, which is a different kind of locust, which is an interesting thing in and of itself. 
But anyway, that was the thing that uh, you'd have to ask Debbie what those five things that she was going to bring uh, were. But nevertheless, don't get distracted by the things, the descriptions that John uses to describe things that are like something. See, one of the things that Christians do is they get distracted by the concept of John developing the, the thing that he sees before him. And he gives, a, and, and in chapter 9 we read, he gives a description of, of how these creatures were presented, both the horses and the riders, as well as the locusts. And, and he gives a descriptive perspective of, of what they're like. But don't get distracted by all of that. Because that's not the big message in the story. It's a bit like when Jesus gave a parable and people interpret parables and they get hundreds of things out of the parables and all Jesus ever intended was to make one point. That's the point of a parable. One point. It, it, you might be able to the, um, spiritualise it and theologicalise it in some form or other, but that isn't what Jesus intended. He intended to give you a consideration in regards to an example to make a point. And so don't get distracted when John starts describing things, thinking that somehow like some Christians have, they've sort of put together all sorts of, you know, considerations regarding how history has unfolded and how things have worked out here and this is because that's taken place and well, well because that happened, well, this is because of the... Don't do that. For two reasons. One, because you couldn't prove it anyway. And two, it isn't worth it. Because God has given us some considerations regarding how things will unfold. And he said it like this, no one knows. All he said was, watch the signs, watch the seasons. But no one knows. And so often Christians get into the book of Revelations and think they've got to somehow just find out the time, date. But don't waste your time because you'll never find out. It won't happen. Trust Jesus when he says, no one knows but my Father. Hold on to that. Because that will help you not get distracted. So, what can we glean from this chapter? John saw a star. John saw a star. It doesn't say he saw something that was like a star. He saw, saw a star fall from heaven to earth. So that's what John saw. Now, star actually is used in the scripture in other occasions. One, one particular occasion is, is uh, a star is Job 38 verse 7. Job uses the idea of a, a star to mean angel. To mean angel. So when John is talking about star here, when the star fell from heaven, he's talking about an angel. John saw a star. Then John uses, in terms of his description in regards to the star, he refers to him as a, a he and a him. So the star isn't the star from sky that fell to the earth. It's a star that fell from heaven to earth. And the star is an angel, not a rock. It's an angel. It's not whatever the substance of a, of a star is made of. I don't even know. But whatever it is. It's, a, it's an angel that fell to earth from heaven. John used the term fallen, and he used had fallen, and, and that's that sense of past tense. It's already happened. It already took place. The angel that fell is already here. And Isaiah 14, 12, he references Lucifer fell from heaven. Ezekiel 21, 28, um, 12 to 16, and Luke 10, verse 18, Satan fallen. In my opinion, John 9, you know, Revelations 9, John referencing, uh, John is talking about the star, and the star is Satan. And fallen is he fell, meaning he fell as if he fell from somewhere to somewhere else. And the somewhere from somewhere else that John fell from and fell to was he fell from good to bad, 
God did not create Satan bad. He was created good. Ezekiel tells us that he was created as the chief worshipper of heaven. That's why worship is so manipulated in churches by demons, Satan. That's why worship has been such a controversy over the years. Lucifer fell from good to bad. When he fell from heaven, he fell from a place of good to a place of bad. I want you to hold that because this character becomes familiar in this conversation that John has as he journeys through the book of Revelations. And then he makes reference to the bottomless pit. And this bottomless pit is locked and then it's opened by a key. Now the bottomless pit that it's referring to here is called the abyss. It's the same word as the word deep, which is recorded in Luke 8, 31, when Jesus wants to deliver the, 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 the uh, demonised man from, from demoniac and the demons request, can we go into the pig? And that story that you, you know about when they run off to the side. The abyss is the place, the home, the abode, the place, the home of evil spirits. And this place, the abyss, the home of evil spirits, where they abode, is locked. And it's locked with a key. Then the judgment of God comes. And the restraint as it relates to these spirits in this abyss is changed. Because the key is given to the one that fell from good to bad. And it depicts the time, the dispensation of change. We know we're in a time of dispensation now, the dispensation of grace. And we can do nothing. I've sang it, we talked about it, we've prayed about it this morning. The grace of God. We live in the atmosphere of grace. But the dispensation time of grace is coming to an end. And John is revealing to the readers in Revelations that there is a time when the dispensation of grace will come to an end. And we move from grace to judgment. Judgment begins When the one that fell from good to bad is given the key to unlock the abyss. And that key is given by him who sits on the throne. So here's an example of an idiom. Smoke went up like the smoke of a great furnace. It was like the smoke. It may not have been the smoke, but it was like the smoke. That's not to say it wasn't a furnace, but it was like a furnace. John is given a description. The smoke that went up when the abyss was open contaminated the air and the sun by making it dark like a smog, from my example. So out of this darkness, this smog, came locusts. Not like locusts, but locusts. John identified them as locusts. This is not an idiom. This is a creature, a locust. They are locusts because John had seen them before. But these locusts were uncharacteristic of ordinary locusts. This is where Debbie's thing would have come useful. They were different because they had a sting to harm men as a scorpion sting. So the difference between these locusts is that they had 
the capacity to harm men like a scorpion sting. Now, it wasn't a scorpion sting. It was like a scorpion sting. To harm mankind. Often when locusts swarm, their destruction is to destroy vegetation. But not these locusts. These locusts were commanded to not destroy vegetation. These locusts were commanded to torment mankind for five months. You see, as we go through this chapter, each time a trumpet blast is blown, the intensity of the judgment on the earth increases. The locust for five months had consent to torment mankind by their sting. So they were locusts, but they were locusts with a difference because a locust doesn't have a sting. It has the capacity to penetrate and suck, but not to inflict. But these locusts do. But they were only allowed to sting the men without the seal on their foreheads. And if we reference back to chapter 7, verse 4, when John brings in the concept of the seal, he was talking about the tribes of Judah, the 144,000 from the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes. The locusts were told not to kill, but to torment. And they tormented in such a way that mankind wanted to die. And it says, but they could not. They wanted to die, but they could not. So these locusts John describes as he saw them, were proactive in bringing about God's judgment on that trumpet blast. I asked the question, did they have a king over them? They don't have a queen, and I don't think they have a king. But these locusts have a king over them. Then... From the throne came a voice of instruction to the sixth angel to blow his trumpet, to release the four restrained angels waiting at the river Euphrates. Back again in a couple of chapters, they were told they could not yet because they had to wait for the complete number to be such. Now the, the complete number has arrived and they are now given consent to go into the earth and bring about their devastation, their destruction and their judgment. Now their judgment on the sixth angel, the sixth trumpet blast, was not to torment but to kill a third of mankind. And John heard a number in heaven, doesn't say where it came from, but he heard a number, 200 million. He heard it in the corridors of heaven, in that vision, on that occasion. An army of 200 million. And then he begins to describe and the, the, the great army and, and the riders. And it says that their weapon was fire, smoke and brimstone. And John describes them as three plagues that came out of the mouths of these horse-like creatures. And he says that the towels were like serpents. Now they wasn't serpents, but they were like serpents. But these had heads with them, heads on them. Serpents with heads. 
and two-thirds of mankind who had witnessed the death of one-third of mankind They had witnessed the plagues, the suffering, the torment, the death, did not repent. They did not turn from their sins. They did not seek the, the mercy of God. They did not pursue forgiveness from God. They continued to worship the demons. They continued to worship idols made of gold, silver, brass, stone, wood, materialism. They continue to have their focus on anything else but God, despite what they'd seen by way of the torment and the judgment. They did not repent. Now, John is wanting the church, he's wanting the church through history to realise that there is a day that's coming when the judgment will begin. John is writing this as an inspiration from the Spirit because he's wanting us to have a wake-up call to the truth that is to come. That's what revelation means. But they can't see, John says, and they can't hear, and they can't walk despite the fact that they'd seen such devastation. Two-thirds would not repent, says John, for murder, sorcery, immorality and theft. The point of John's revelation to the world, to people, to you and me, is God has decided one day there will be a judgment. And he's warned us early so that when the judgment comes, we will not be trapped, so entangled by the deceitfulness of sin that we would not be able to repent not be able to turn from our wicked ways, not be able to seek again the heart and grace and mercy of the Father. There is a place that we can come to as an individual human being, like Lucifer, who fell from good to bad, that we can't recover from. And John is wanting, Jesus is wanting, God is wanting. Don't come to that place. And the Apostle Paul sums it up in these fantastic words that I'm going to read to you from, from Romans chapter 1. Eighteen to the end. Unbelief and its consequences. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honour him as God or give thanks but they became futile in their speculation and the foolish hearts was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of a, corrupt, a corruptible man 
and a bird or four-footed animal or crawling creature. These words. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonoured among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their woman exchanged the natural functions for that which is unnatural. And the same way also the man abandoned the natural functions of the woman and burned in their desire towards one another. Man with man committing indecent acts and revealing in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to the deprived minds to do these things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossip, slanderers, hating, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they knew the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give heartily approval to those who practice them. And it says, God gave them over. And John 9 is the great warning to all who would take notice of it. Revelations 9, John speaking, is the great warning to the church, to all Christians, that we need to be wise. We need to be wise. We need to not allow ourselves to be so contaminated by the world that we get drawn into its philosophies and its thinking, thinking that somehow God will somehow just excuse the behaviour. He is a holy God. All through the scripture we see a God of holiness. And any indulgence from holiness is an offence to God. Only Jesus creates the opportunity for justifying the inappropriateness of our behaviour. But even in Jesus, there comes a day when the curtain is drawn on grace and judgment will begin. Now, there is a grace in judgment, but that's another thing for another day. But the reality of this is a warning. Don't get entangled. Don't be deceived. This is the message of protection for us. Because if we get entangled, we may not be able to recover from it. So I'm going to pray. <coughs> Lord, I recognise the reality of the, the, the heaviness of what this scripture really means to us. And we hate talking about judgment because it really makes us think, well, you know, this is not what we want to be listening to. This isn't what we want to be seeing. But we cannot, we cannot deny the reality that you are a holy God. And we confessed already before you that we are an unrighteous people. Lord, we know we are sinners, but we know that we are saved by grace. Lord Jesus, if in any way we have travelled a pathway that is in some way hampering our ability to develop as the desired intention of your heart, we pray you would reveal it to us. We pray we would not be deceived or, or set up or trapped by the snare of sin so that we can't escape the reality of the judgment to come because we have deceived ourselves. Lord, we don't want you to ever say to us that you gave us over to the depravity of our minds. We don't want to work in rebellion to you. We don't want to be a people who stand against your will and desire. Lord Jesus, we pray reveal to us if we have in any way stepped out of line, did what we should not have done, said what we should not have said, acted in an inappropriate way. May we, like Paul, keep a short account, a daily account. May we not sleep with sin in our hearts. 
May our hearts always long for purity. May we never judge those who offend us. May we never criticise those that we make judgments upon. May we be filled with the fragrance of fresh living water, that we might be those who purify and bring joy and hope. Lord, we know that one day judgment is coming, but we recognise in these days we are in the atmosphere of grace. We pray that you would give us the courage to take every opportunity that is before us as we live out our lives on a daily basis. Lord, and when our day comes and our lives on earth end, that we would not in any way be displeasing to you. Lord Jesus, there will be no issue with us and you. We would be pure of heart and mind to the best of our ability. So show us, Lord. Protect us, Lord. Not only us here, but the whole of your church, all of your people. Oh God, bring your people back to a place of heartfelt purity for you. Amen. 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 So what do you do after something like that? I don't know. You just have to maybe just love each other and say, thank you, Jesus, for where we are. May the Lord bless us. Keep us, may his face shine upon us. May we be an enrichment to one another as we walk about our day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.